Well, one day, oil's gonna run out, coal's gonna run out, and from an oil perspective, some people say that day could be as, as soon as 50 years from now. Over half the energy that, that we uh, consume is lost. I'm really interested in solar technology as a form of energy for the future. This type of technology, bringing in the power of a hair dryer to go 2,400 miles at 55 miles an hour, is something that could definitely be used in the future. Well, the solar car itself is a uh, combination of the, the best of electrical engineering, the best of mechanical engineering put together. But from a solar uh, power perspective, what we're doing is taking the power from the sun, and somehow we need to convert that into usable energy for uh, to power the car, and that's done through an electric motor. And it, an electric motor is a transitional technology that transitions between electrical engineering on one side that manages the power in terms of voltages and currents that uh, go into the motor and then on the output side provides the torque to drive the car. Uh, what we do is when sunlight hits our solar cells due to their material composition, um, a photon in the sun essentially knocks out an electron uh, in the solar cell material. This causes an energy flow. We can then use that power to do one of two things. Um, one, if our car is not moving, we can store it in batteries to be used later. However, if we do want our car to start going, then we send that power to our electric motor and it propels us down the road. Gato del Sol happened to be a perfect fit for us, um, being the Kentucky Wildcats. In Spanish, the name Gato del Sol means cat of the sun. And so it was a perfect fit for us being uh, the University of Kentucky Wildcats building a solar powered vehicle. On the top of the shell, we've got 480 silicon solar cells. Those total 100 volts of potential, which comes out as 1200 watts of power. Um, that right there runs to our motor, which is uh, up to a nine horsepower motor driving the car. The batteries weigh the most um, of the entire car. The top speed's 55 miles an hour. Our maintainable speed is more around 30, but with a new motor and new solar cells, that can easily go up to 50 or 55 maintainable speed. Our car is uh, 1.8 meters wide and five meters long. It weighs about 650 pounds with, uh, fully loaded with a driver. Uh, our drivers are ballasted, so it's not really an advantage to having a, a lighter driver in there. Everyone. Um, will eventually weigh the same amount. When you get to the race, uh, they're typically done in stages where the first few days are used uh, for what's called scrutineering. Scrutineering is um, where uh, the race officials go through your car and inspect the mechanical systems, the electrical systems, the handling performance, and the ability of the driver to uh, get out of the car in, in an emergency. Uh, it's called egress. And so those uh, first few days are spent uh, in intense scrutineering. And many of the cars that show up and go through that scrutineering, they don't get approved for the race. Following the scrutineering, there's a qualifying race on the track where we prove that our vehicle um, not only looks like it's, it's going to be good enough for the race, but that it actually can perform uh, at the speeds required to complete the cross-country challenge. We wake up every morning about 6 a.m. Um, first thing we do is look at the weather. If we've got a lot of sun, we got our car out there charging, uh, and then we can, we can store up a pretty decent amount of energy in the morning. And at 8 a.m. is when our, our race day starts. So each team might be scattered out uh, across different parts of the race route. Um, then at 8 a.m., we all start driving. We're out there amongst all the other vehicles. So that presents a lot of challenges. Uh, our vehicle is a lot different and from a, a normal petroleum-powered vehicle. And due to the nature of the race, our speed is dictated by how much sunlight there is.
typically student groups turn over uh, every two to three years. Uh, it's rare that you have a, uh, one or two students that stay uh, involved longer than that. And so you see a large percentage of your experience base walk out the door every two to three years. And that's basically part of the educational experience here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, it's challenging though, the most challenging part is uh, the handoff of technology and information from the outgoing group to the incoming group. And so from the perspective of an advisor, this, uh, what I've tried to do is take more of a hands-off approach and let this be truly a student-run project. And uh, as I've said from the beginning, the project lives and dies with the students. And uh, that's a good thing from a responsibility standpoint. And, and all of the groups that I've worked with so far here at UK have, have met the challenge. Dr. Stevens is uh, about the ideal advisor for a student project. He understands how much we students benefit from, um, from really doing the whole process ourselves. It's a student-led project, and, and he really uh, respects that boundary well. I have, have perceived the team in the past, and what we want to see for the future of the team is to always bring in as many new students from every, every possible organization or, or any all gamut of all majors is what we try to do. We really do want everybody on the team because you know, engineers think about certain things. We think we problem solve, but we don't, we don't necessarily innovate the best way we're supposed to. So when we have people from all types of, all types of life working on our team together, we notice that we're more creative at, at solving the problems. So, it, I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, what your major is. It's just, it's just are, you, are you creative? Do you have the passion to work on a, on a project like this? And if you do, then we want you. I think one of the coolest aspects is really none of us are experts on this. You know, we've got professors to teach us stuff in the class, and they're what you call experts in their field. Um, but we're not experts on this. We're all going through it, learning as much as we can through the process. And uh, luckily, we've got people who are older than us to pass down knowledge, and we gain it ourselves and pass it on. And hopefully, you know, that avalanches, I guess, over a number of years. At the end of the day, though, when, when you pull into a town and you see people looking at your car and and pulling off the side of the road to take pictures. It's, it's a great feeling to be sitting there driving a solar powered car and, and seeing the hope in people's eyes that some of the technology that we use might, might someday be the future of transportation.